Afternoon, everybody. Happy Friday to you. Got a full house here. This is great. Well, I think you know we have a special guest uh, briefer here today, uh, and I'm not going to take too much uh, time until we give him the, the podium, but the, the president's special envoy for the Global Coalition to Counter ISIL, Brett McGurk, is going to be uh, giving you a, an update on coalition efforts against ISIL in Iraq and in Syria. Uh, and then he'll stick around and be able to take a few questions, not many. Uh, and then after that, we'll I'll get up here and we'll uh, we'll go through the regular daily briefing. I know there are a lot of questions about what happened in uh, in Mali today. Uh, I'll be prepared uh, on the back end of uh, Brett's briefing uh, to deal with that and to take those questions. Uh, and and then whatever else is on your on your mind for today. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. McGurk. So thanks for allowing me to take a few minutes here uh, just to update you on on what we're what we're doing against against ISIL. And I was with a lot of you in Vienna and then Antalya and then Paris. I uh, spent an extra day in Paris. And a real theme, of course, coming out of those trips is not only our, our solidarity with the French, uh, but our commitment uh, across the entire globe, and you really felt this, I think, in Antalya, uh, to accelerate our efforts against this barbaric terrorist organization. And what we are doing now, um, the steps we're taking have really been building for the last year. If you go back to a year ago, um, the thought of our putting real pressure on the heartland of ISIL in its main connections between Raqqa and Mosul, something we wanted to do, but it wasn't impossible to do that a year ago, taking back uh, major ground and territory. Uh, finding out about the financial networks, the economic structures, how they're actually financing themselves, and then trying to root that out. That wasn't possible about a year ago, even six months ago, but it's possible now. So I think we have an opportunity now, uh, in the wake of Paris, to really galvanize the entire coalition uh, and intensify our pressure across the board. And I would put it in two ways. We want to make no mistake. We're going to destroy this terrorist organization. And in two ways, we're going to suffocate the core, which is in Iraq and Syria and we are going to suffocate the global networks. And the global networks is something that everybody is focused on now, and rightfully so, and I've said this before, we've never really seen anything like this before. 30,000 foreign fighters, these jihadi fighters, coming from 100 countries all around the world into Syria and Iraq. Um, depending on who's counting, there are different numbers from the 80s, but it's almost it's about double the number that went into Afghanistan in the 80s. Those guys came from just a handful of countries. This is 100 countries all around the world. Myself and General Allen over the last year traveled to about 30 capitals and coalition capitals, including uh, North Africa, Europe, Gulf states, Asia. And you heard a common theme of what's driving a lot of these young men and women uh, to join this fight in Iraq and Syria. And it is this phony notion of the caliphate that Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi announced in the summer of 2014. And his core driving philosophy, if you really read it, going all the way back to Zarqawi in 2004, is this expanding uh, state that they claim to be trying to create, this war of flags of constant expansion. So one of our core focus areas, therefore, in suffocating the core is shrinking uh, that area. And that is happening. So I wanted to go through, take about 10 minutes, really, to go through what we're, what we're doing now. Uh, it's a combination of activities, economic, diplomatic, political, military, and talk about that, and then also what we're doing, of course, in the global, uh, with the global networks. But in suffocating the core, I think you have a general map there just to situate where you are, and you've heard a lot about these disparate pieces, but when we look at it every day, those of us working on this every day with our national security team in the White House and the Pentagon and Treasury Department, uh, they all, it's all part of a, a coherent whole. And if you go around the map, I just go clockwise. There's been a lot of talk, of course, we were all just in Turkey about this 98 kilometer area. It's the last area of the border that ISIL still controls with Turkey. It's on the top left of the map. There's a town called Mare. You hear about the Mare line. That is the extent of ISIL's westward advance. They have tried now for a number of months to move further west. Uh, we've worked very hard with the Turks diplomatically extremely close cooperation with Turkey, 
and with groups that are on the ground to ensure that uh, this is going to be the extent of ISIL's westward advance, and now we're going to start pushing them back. My colleagues in the Defense Department can talk in more detail about that, but of course, at Interlake Air Base, we've significantly increased our, our presence with F-16s, with A-10s, and most recently with F-15s, and that came out of an agreement that we negotiated with the Turks now going back about three or four months ago, and we think that's going quite well. So in our cooperation with Turkey, politically, diplomatically, talking to the Turks very closely about how we are going to coordinate to do this. There are activities on the ground going on now with the fighters on the Mari line against, against ISIL, and also there are things we expect and hope the Turks will do on their side of the border to shut off this last stretch of territory uh, to ISIL. If you go to the east, what I would say is number two, it's very important as you see the Euphrates River uh, bisect Syria, the entire eastern side of the Euphrates River, which a year or so ago was almost all entirely under ISIL, is now entirely uh, uh, inhospitable to ISIL. That, of course, started in the town of Kobani. At one point, we were down to just a few blocks in Kobani and a few hundred of the, the fighters in Kobani defending the town. We made a decision about a year ago to help them, starting with an airdrop and then military support, and they have expanded from there. A very significant defeat to ISIL in which we then took away their main border entry point, which is on the map here of Talabiad. Talabiad was their hub. It was their economic hub. It was their, where they processed all of their foreign fighters. <laughs> Uh, it is no longer um, an area in which they can do anything. And this expansion of the fighters in this part of Syria continues. And if you go to the east of Syria, in Hasaka, south of there, Al-Hal, and my colleagues at DOD have talked about this, and our role has been diplomatically trying to get these forces on the ground to work together, cooperation with some of the Iraqi Kurds to make this all work. It's been very difficult. Um, but over the last about 30 days, um, they've launched a series of operations against ISIL, and it's been quite successful taking that town of Al-Hal and then pushing south. And that has been synchronized, just keep going clockwise, with what's happening in Sinjar. Sinjar, again, took a lot of diplomatic activity, a lot of trips to northern Iraq, a lot of coordination with the Kurdish Peshmerga uh, to help set up the conditions to do this. And that operation launched about uh, two weeks ago and Kurdish Peshmerga uh, retook the town of Sinjar. Why that is important and why we have been focusing on it for so long is that the lifeline for Daesh, ISIL, in its core here between Raqqa and Mosul, the I-95 corridor, is a highway called Highway 47. And they've been able to tra traverse it, uh, only getting pressure on the air. They've not gotten pressure on the ground. Now, with the Kurdish Peshmerga retaking Sinjar, we have cut that main highway and our simultaneous efforts that are ongoing in Syria will continue to constrict. This is part of this suffocation. We want to isolate them in Raqqa, we want to isolate them in Mosul, and then continue to uh, strangle and increase the pressure, and that's going to continue. If you just go further, um, there's Mosul. We have worked with the <coughs> Iraqi Peshmerga diplomatically and with the government of Iraq to set up uh, in Makmur a joint headquarters. We're planning the operation of Mosul. Uh, make no, no mistake, that's going to take some time, but we are already now, there's a new governor in Nineveh province and working with him to recruit local fighters and organize them to begin to put pressure, constrict, and suffocate, and that's something that will continue. If you go south, uh, go south towards Baghdad and the Tigris River, it's important to remember in the summer of 2014 when ISIL was pouring down the Tigris River Valley, pressing on Baghdad, now the dynamic is complete opposite. The Beijing oil refinery, uh, something that I think historians will look at the fight for the Beijing oil refinery, and the Iraqis fought quite heroically there. We, of course, helped them over 14 months with airdrops and military support, and Iraqi forces ultimately now have secured the Beijing refinery, secured Beijing, and that, we think, is really now the extent of ISIL's uh, southern advance. Go south to Beijing and to Crete. To Crete is very important because it's where everything came together, the economic, political, and diplomatic. Extremely difficult situation at first. Um, in terms of the retaking of Tikrit, there were a lot of uh, Shia militia groups involved in that operation in the beginning, and uh, it didn't go particularly well. The Iraqi government came to us and asked for help. We worked very closely with them diplomatically and politically to set the conditions in place to help them. They ultimately retook Tikrit. But since Tikrit has been retaken, what's most important, this, of course, is an iconic Sunni city, and working with the global coalition, with the United Nations, with the government of Iraq, set up an international stabilization fund to help get 
refugees back into the city of Tikrit. And now about 70, 75% of the population has returned to Tikrit. That's significant because in most areas here in Iraq and Syria, the population is not returning to their homes. We have it actually working in Tikrit. It's far from perfect. It's hard every single day. Our embassy team is working it every day with the UN and with the government of Iraq. And we're learning lessons every day of how that went and what we can do better as we move on to other areas. I'll just loop around because one of the other areas is, of course, Ramadi. Uh, Ramadi fell about 90 days ago and it was a significant setback to the overall campaign, something we've talked about in detail. We know what ISIL wanted to do when they took Ramadi. They wanted to sweep east down the Euphrates River and again pressure Baghdad, basically collapse the Iraqi security forces. We made a, an immediate decision, working with Prime Minister Badi and the Iraqi government at his invitation. We sent some of our uh, special forces units into Takadam Air Base to help the Iraqis regroup, reorganize, recruit local fighters, and begin to push back. They halted that ISIL advance entirely, and now they are moving um, on Ramadi, and my DOD colleagues can talk about that in more detail. But given what ISIL tried to do, and given where they are now, uh, that is now going the right way, although it's extremely, extremely difficult. Iraqi security forces in this operation, do you take Ramadi, have already suffered about 1,200 casualties, about 200 dead. Uh, they are fighting, they're dying to retake their country, and that's something that we are very much uh, going to help them do. Two more points on this map before I get to the global network. Uh, Haditha, going up the uh, Euphrates River Valley there. Haditha has been a focus for ISIL. They've poured everything they possibly could at it, uh, and they have failed. We have worked with the coalition at Al-Assad Air Base. I've been out there now a number of times ourselves. Uh, the Australians, the Danes, uh, we are there, not only working with Iraqi security forces, but also working with local uh, tribal fighters. And they have now gone from defensive maneuver operate to actually expanding the pre their presence and defeating ISIL and doing um, offensive operations. That's quite significant because we've had to work closely politically with the Iraqi government and pull a number of measures together on the economic humanitarian side and the military side. And I think Haditha is where a lot of that has come together. The final point, just to finish the circle, is in Araka. Um, Araka is where we think their leaders are, uh, where we think a lot of their uh, planning cells exist, and we are going to do all we possibly can, working with all the forces available, and working politically, dip dip diplomatically, and across the economic <laughs> line of effort to isolate and entrap I ISIL in Araka. So that's all I'll say about that now, but I think the fact that just last week, uh, going after Jihadi John, uh, the fact that Junaid Hussein, you know, we found them on the streets of Raqqa and were able to conduct a very precise target operations thanks to the great work that our colleagues do, and that's going to uh, continue. We have seen that as we continue to put, put pressure on ISIL, they make mistakes, they do stupid things, and we are going to really do all we can to intensify uh, the pressure over these coming weeks. Let me talk about outside the core and the networks. These are the foreign fighter flows, the foreign fighter networks. Uh, we've done a lot over the last year. When we started the coalition, there wasn't, as, there wasn't much focus on this at all, quite frankly. We passed a Chapter 7 resolution since that time. We've had about 44 countries have passed new uh, laws, uh, 22 countries uh, reinforcing the legal frameworks. But most importantly, we've had about 34 countries now around the world, and it's quite significant, um, have arrested foreign fighters or broken up cells and networks. And what we want to do now within the coalition, this started some time ago, but we really need to accelerate it, is it's one thing to break up a plot in one capital and another capital. It's another thing to work across our law enforcement intelligence communities, work within a coalition to share information and just collapse and shock the networks. And that's what we want to do. We need to work as a global community, as a global coalition to share information. As one capital breaks up a cell, as another capital breaks up, this, breaks up a cell, uh, we have to connect the dots and shock these networks and, and collapse them. There's a role for every country in the coalition to play in this regard. There's a role uh, particularly for Turkey to play, but there's also a role for what we call the source countries in which people are coming from capitals all around the world into Turkey and then into Syria. Uh, within the EU, they have had a debate for some time about what we call passenger name uh, registries in terms of passenger airplanes and a debate between uh, privacy versus security is something that they've been debating for some time. We obviously feel very strongly that we have to get those PNR uh, implements, instruments in place. 
we know how to do this. We are very focused on the homeland. We know everybody coming in. Uh, we keep these records very carefully. Uh, bureaus here in the State Department track this every single day. And it's something that we need our coalition partners uh, to assist with, and we believe very strongly uh, in their capitals to do the same. Um, I know the EU is talking about this today in Brussels. Um, I will be seeing their political director later today, and we feel very strongly that now is the time to move forward on some of these uh, very important uh, protections. On top of this effort against uh, ISIL is the ongoing conflict in Syria, and many of you are in Vienna, and of course this is a primary focus of ours. And the, really the core element of that second Vienna communique is not only a timeline in which everybody has agreed upon, but getting all those critical countries in the room, the entire permanent five members of the Security Council, uh, the Saudis, the Iranians, and everybody else. Uh, those have been very intense conversations, but I think overall very constructive conversations. And a key element in that communique is the concept of a ceasefire, because there's broad recognition that we all need to focus on these terrorist groups and that the ongoing conflict between the regime and the opposition uh, can sometimes get in the way of that. However, that conflict will not wind down unless we have a credible process for a political transition. So there is some convergence of views. I think the process in Vienna has been uh, constructive, and that is obviously as we're focused on ISIL and suffocating the networks, we are focused very intensively on the diplomatic track because many of these things uh, are linked. That's a very broad brush overview of what we're trying to do, but just make no mistake, and um, I just came from the White House. We're, of course, getting ready for the visit of President Hollande. We just, just saw him uh, the other day in Paris. And we stand with them. We're going to help them. Uh, they're moving the Charles de Gaulle, it's there now, into the Eastern Mediterranean. It'll then be going into the Gulf. Uh, we're helping them with more intelligence sharing with the agreement we just signed with them. And uh, we are going to work with them and with the entire coalition to suffocate uh, these networks and to destroy this terrorist organization. But finally, it's going to take time. Um, there are just no shortcuts here. Uh, these guys, it grew, they grew out of the AQI, an enemy that we knew very well, uh, but they are better in every respect. They're better manned, they're better funded, they're better resourced, they're better fighters. And of course, we are working with uh, indigenous forces on the ground to do the fighting on the ground, because we feel very strongly uh, that that is the longer term solution. But we are putting U.S. Special Forces on the ground into Syria, as the President has announced, to help enable those forces. We are putting U.S. Special Forces on the ground. Of course, we already have them in Iraq to help advise and assist and enable. And those are the types of things that we'll be looking to uh, intensify over the coming weeks. Start with a few questions here. I, I'm, I'm okay. okay. go ahead. Uh, yes, you, you make a, a, a good case about shrinking the core ISIS territory in Syria and Iraq. But parallel to that, in uh, recent months, we've seen that they're able to carry out attacks in continental Europe. They appear to have uh, planted a bomb on a, a Russian plane in Sinai. Several groups in Africa <coughs> have either pledged allegiance to them or have sprouted out of ISIS sympathizers in Libya, uh, arguably Nigeria, other parts of the, of the Sahel. Uh, how does this fit into the bro a broader global campaign against uh, ISIS and jihadi-style groups? Well, one thing, it's not just focused on Iraq and Syria, as I tried to say. So we have to focus on Iraq and Syria because that's one of the main draws and appeal, and we cannot allow these guys to have safe haven. So uh, suffocating the core is critical. But at the same time, in parallel and just as intense and just as determined and just as decisive, we want to focus on the, on the global networks. Um, the global affiliates, you know, it's, it's more complicated than sometimes – uh, there, a lot of these terrorist groups have already been existing for some time, and just because they put up an ISIL flag doesn't necessarily make it um, uh, more of a threat than it might have already been. However, when, and we're looking at each affiliate very closely, we have a whole process for this, we're looking at are there connections between uh, ISIL core in Raqqa and the global affiliate? Are there foreign fighter flows? Is there messaging coordination? And that is why when we see that, and when we see a leader affiliated with ISIL, uh, we will not hesitate, obviously, to take action. And you just saw that last week where we targeted the head of ISIL in Libya. So this is something that is going to continue. Um, but this is a global network. It is spread by uh, modern technology and social networking. Uh, it is a challenge, something we have not seen before. And that's why we have to do this. That's why we built a global coalition of, of 65 members and we need to coordinate better, share information more, do it faster. Um, on Monday here at the State Department, we will be bringing in all the ambassadors of the coalition, uh, and we will address them in some detail about our plans going forward. We will also be very specific 
for some additional resource needs we need from them. Uh, and we expect that Vice President Biden will come and, and address those ambassadors on Monday. You, you began by talking about the 98 kilometer stretch of the Syrian Turkish border. Um, why has it been so difficult to close that given that you have a functioning state to the north with an enormous standing army? What is so difficult about undertaking and then prosecuting that effort? Oh, it's a good question. It's, it's a significant stretch of territory, and within that gap area, um, we call it the Monbij Gap, ISIL has fortified itself in there. So in that little 98-kilometer 90, by 40-kilometer area, the town of Dabiq is there. Dabiq is their kind of ideological uh, capital. It's where they, in their perverse view of the world, believe Armageddon is going to begin. That's a very fortified ISIL uh, town. Mombij is an area in which they collect foreign fighters and, and direct them across uh, the battlefield. Uh, Drobulus, Arai are areas in which they continue to uh, funnel foreign fighters in. So this is a heartland for them, and they are fortified there. So to find the forces on the ground uh, to do the fighting and to do it in a way in which we know they're going to win uh, is something that we are in mill-to-mill -mill conversations with the Turks on. Uh, but more importantly, and this came up in the conversation with President uh, Obama and President Erdogan in Turkey, our efforts that the Turks are going to take on their side of the border. But the Turks have made clear to us uh, they are all in on this effort. Um, they have been, I think, the, from the moment that we opened uh, the Interlake uh, Air Base Agreement and started flying out of there. And one thing you can look at is that, you know, the Turks are flying F-16s and doing bombing runs against ISIL in this Marline area, uh, you know, regularly, consistently now. So. It's a difficult geography, it's d difficult uh, terrain, and um, I defer to my military colleagues in terms of exactly how it will go, but we want to get it right, but it's also already started. You just look at what we're doing every single day in terms of airstrikes in this area, and but most importantly, working with the Turks to coordinate to make sure that we can get this right. And that's a conversation from President Obama and President Erdogan. It's a conversation I have had a number of times. I was in Ankara before Antalya last week to see their foreign minister and others. Um, our Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff I spoke with yesterday is going, uh, is on his way to Turkey. And uh, much of our conversations here are focused on, on taking care of this last stretch of territory. John? Yes, one question. Uh, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McGurk. Uh, about your political, uh, your military aid for the Iraqi Kurds, uh, some people, including some people and organizations, including the International Crisis Group, have suggested that you condition that military aid on, say, political reform, because they are afraid that this political rivalry in the region could escalate into uh, the more violence. Uh, do you set any conditions for the military aid you provide for the KRG? It's uh, a good question. I've spent a lot of time uh, with the Kurds over the last year, uh, well, well before that, but especially over the last year in Erbil and Suli and Dahuk, um, as with all the political parties at a critical moment in their political process just a few months ago, we are deeply, deeply engaged with all the Kurdish parties. Uh, and our message to them is clear that when the Kurds are united, nothing can defeat them. And we saw that, uh, we saw that in Kobani. In Kobani, as I said, we came to the aid of the defenders of the town of Kobani, but then we also worked diplomatically very aggressively with Turkey. And I was in Ankara uh, late one evening with General Allen and, and Prime Minister Davutoglu about getting resupplies into Kobani. And the Turks, of course, then opened a corridor for the Iraqi Kurdish Peshmerga to come into Kobani. It was a moment in which the Kurds really united against this threat, and they, they dealt a decisive blow to, uh, to ISIL. We do get concerned when we see the Kurdish parties politically divided because this war is not over. Uh, the Kurds are suffering martyrs every single day, so we constantly encourage them uh, to unite their ranks against this threat. There will be political disagreements, there are time for those, but right now we really encourage the Kurds to be united against this threat. Uh, in terms of military support, we're working closely with the Peshmerga across the board, working closely with all the Kurdish parties, the PUK and the KDP, um, and we're get, making sure that they have what they need to, to prevail. Just one more question on, on the Syrian Kurds, just one more. Uh, Sir, you, the United States has definitely been uh, supporting the Syrian Kurds a lot, and without the United States' support, Kobani could have fallen. 
Uh, but uh, the now uh, the, the Syrian Kurds, when you talk to their leaders, they say we need more uh, actual ammunition, actual weapons. And the United States has said, for example, even the recent airdrop was uh, intended for the Arab opposition, not for the Kurds or, uh, Kurdish forces. What is the hesitation here? Why the United States is not openly and actively providing them with weapons as well? It's willing to provide air cover for them. I just don't understand that quite well. I'm just not going to discuss all the all the details here of these of these conversations, but uh, we're going to work with groups that are fighting ISIL and make sure they have what they need to, to succeed. Could you tell us um, anything about the role of U.S. military advisors on the ground? Are they are they literally just providing advice? or have they actually been engaged in any fighting, in any military action, actually handling weapons? Well, for the most part, our military advisors are providing uh, advisory support, training, and assistance. Uh, that's across the board. So we have site two, two sites in Anbar province, uh, or in Taji, uh, in Baghdad, of course, Basmaya, uh, and across the Kurdish Iraqi region. And we're joined by a number of coalition partners from Spain to the Dutch to the Danes. Uh, to the Australians, the Brits, and the French. Uh, the French have a number of significant assets on the ground that are working very closely with us, particularly in northern Iraq. So it was primarily training, advice, support. Uh, the effort I mentioned in uh, Takadam Air Base, for example, it was about getting the Iraqis reorganized, getting them on their feet, helping them facilitate working with the Iraqi government in Baghdad to get the forces available, to begin to repush, take, uh, take the initiative against uh, ISIL in, in Ramadi. However, there are times, of course, when uh, we believe it's in our national security interest and the president authorizes for more direct action missions. So you've seen that against Abu Sayyaf, the number one financier of, of ISIL, uh, an operation into northern Syria about five, six months ago now. And we collected more information off that site than we have in any special forces operation in history. It was what has led now to a number of operations to really just completely uproot uh, ISIL's economic financial networks in Deir Zor in eastern Syria, and you're going to see more of that. A lot of that came out of that raid. And of course, uh, when we helped uh, the Iraqi Kurdish Peshmerga do the rescue operation against uh, the 70 hostages, and of course we lost a brave American in that operation. So uh, we have people in harm's way risking their life against this barbaric enemy, and that's going to continue. Um, but I will say I was in Erbil and met um, I met these hostages who were rescued, all of whom were about to be executed the next morning. And, um, you know, it was just an incredible moment. And it just spoke to how important this is and why we need to do every, every possible, everything we can to prevail. Okay, we're going to just take one more, Saeed. I'll give you the last question. Thank you. Uh, so I wanted to ask you about uh, Anbar. You said that you are mobilizing indigenous forces. What is the status of mobilizing the indigenous forces in the Anbar region to liberate Romani? Well, we set, a, we set a target, and it was in the Iraqi budget of about 8,000 uh, tribal fighters in Anbar province paid for by the Iraqi government. Uh, we have had full cooperation from Prime Minister Abadi and the government for that effort. Uh, we have about, and the, the numbers fluctuate a little, little bit, we have about 7,000 in Anbar who are fighting. And we have found that when the tribes mobilize and are able to coordinate with us, they're extremely successful. Um, but, you know, let's remember, ISIL didn't just come into Anbar province when Mosul fell. They actually moved into Fallujah and into Ramadi on January 1st, 2014, <clears throat> going on almost two years now. And even before that, all through 2013, uh, they were decimating the tribal structures and the networks, kind of trying to hollow out uh, the societal structures that had existed. So this is extremely hard work. Um, that's why we have these two sites in Anbar province to help mobilize uh, the local indigenous forces to take back their communities. And most importantly, uh, you know, Prime Minister Bodies, he has a philosophy of, of governance consistent with Iraq's constitution. It's embedded, interwoven in their constitution of, of decentralization and empowering the governors and local leaders to provide for their own affairs. So you, you've seen that in Tikrit, where the governor of Saladin and the local leaders there have been empowered to help bring people back to their streets. And we've been working very closely with the governor of Anbar province and the local leaders of Anbar province to help ensure that when neighborhoods are taken back, and it's going to be neighborhood by neighborhood, it will be extremely difficult, this is Ramadi we're talking about, that the resources are there, that the police are there to come back to the streets, and the Italians have led an effort to train the Anbari uh, police, training about a 1,000 of them right now, and that the governor and the local leaders have the resources they need to help bring people back uh, to the streets. So 
I think we've had very good cooperation between the local leaders out in Anbar province and the central government uh, facilitated by our folks. Uh, but, you know, it's very difficult. ISIL is going to put up an extremely hard fight. Uh, the three, you know, pr primary, predominantly Sunni capitals in Anbar, Tikrit, Tikrit is no longer ISIL's, under ISIL's control, Mosul, and Ramadi. And uh, ISIL and its predecessor AQI have fought for Ramadi for years, and they are not going to give up without a major fight. I mentioned the casualties the Iraqis have already taken to take it back. Uh, and this is going to be a very difficult fight. But we are, and you can get the briefing from Colonel Warren, who, who gives ex excellent briefings and real detailed briefings of what we are doing to help enable uh, those forces right now on the ground. So this will take some time, but I think we have the pieces in place to do it. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, everybody. Um, I know everybody's uh, following the major st story today out of Mali, so I do have some updates for you. Uh, and the information is literally still coming in. Um, Malian authorities report that the security incident at the Radisson Hotel has concluded. Our embassy there is lifting its recommendation for U.S. citizens to shelter in place. However, the embassy continues to urge all U.S. citizens to minimize movement around Bamako and be vigilant of their surroundings. And they want, uh, uh, they want them to continue monitoring local media for updates and adhere to instructions of local authorities. Um, we would also like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Malian and other first responders and security forces who responded to this attack so promptly and quickly um, and help uh, and help rescue uh, so many, and that would include uh, members of the U.S. Uh, military who happened to be at the site at the time and and chipped in to assist first responders in moving people to secure locations. Um, I can confirm that all the chief of mission mission personnel who were at the hotel at the time of the attack are accounted for and are in a safe location. I don't have any information to corroborate reports concerning the number of U.S. citizens in the hotel. Uh, uh, about a dozen Americans, including chief of mission personnel in that dozen, um, were rescued. The uh, embassy in Bamako is providing all appropriate consular assistance, as you might expect. Um, I have no U.S. injuries or deaths to report at this time. We're working to verify uh, the safety and security of U.S. citizens there in Bamako. We're still working through that process right now. The embassy uh, as I said, uh, is uh, is uh, restoring, you know, returning to normal uh, duties, but again, urging uh, everybody to be uh, vigilant. Uh, there is one rumor I'd like to put the rest. Uh, it was a rumor, I think, uh, in some press reporting that a, a U.S. diplomatic plated vehicle was somehow used or involved in the attack. That is not true. There was, in fact, a diplomatic plated vehicle uh, at the hotel at the time of the attack. It was there for a completely other purposes, driven by government employees, and the driver and passengers were able to escape without harm. So there was no involvement by a, um, a diplomatic plated vehicle in the attack. There's also been some reports that the airport is closed. That is not true. I think there's one carrier uh, that has uh, halted its flights in and out of uh, Bamako, but uh, but the airport is open. Uh, there's been no curtailment of air operations there by the, the, the vast bulk of, uh, of, of carriers. Uh, before, so, before you go on, when, or do you have other stuff to get to? Uh, let me make sure I don't have anything else, Matt. No, I well, I just want to ask about the car. The, 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 you're saying that there was, there was a U.S. diplomatic plated vehicle at the hotel, but that was, uh, and, and, uh, and that was the car that people were talking about, or are you, are you saying, not ruling out, that uh, another car with a, a non-U.S. diplomatic plate or, or a U.S. diplomatic plate well, could have... What I'm saying been. is that there, there were rumors that a U.S. diplomatic plated vehicle was used in the attack or involved in the attack by the attackers. That is false. Uh, well, was there was a U.S. diplomatic vehicle on the site, 
driven by government employees that were there for uh, official business. Right. Um, and they were able to escape and their pa the driver and passenger were able to escape without harm. We have no evidence that a U.S. diplomatic vehicle was in any way involved. <laughs> right. I, in I, I missed the report that said it was a U.S. diplomatic plate, but um, what about any diplomatic plate? Or you do know? I don't. Oh, okay. And, and then did, the- Did they uh, escape on foot and leave the car at the scene? They Is escaped in the vehicle. And, in the vehicle. Yeah. And, and why, you know, what was going on there that, that, they, that, that they were at this hotel? Well, um, was it was it a meeting or were they just no there for no no these are cocktails they're, they're no no uh, as you know Matt there are sometimes uh, uh, diplomatic personnel that are on temporary duty uh, to one or other missions around the world and um, it, it uh, oftentimes uh, hotels so they, they hotels serve as lodging so it was lodging okay. and they need transportation to and from to get to work and that kind of thing and so gotcha. this was a this was a passenger van that was used to help transport people to and from as they needed to do their business. But they were, as far as I know, they were there simply because of lodging. Yeah. Yeah. Um, John, you said that U.S. military helped move people to safe locations. Um, could you detail other ways in which U.S. diplomatic or military personnel uh, were involved? The, there were, there was no active involvement that I'm aware of by U.S. military uh, uh, or U.S. government personnel with respect to dealing with the attack itself. It was it was Malian forces uh, who did the uh, the preponderance of of the work here. Now it's just just wrapping up. So I mean I, I don't have a list of everybody that was involved, but it's my understanding that um, there were some uh, U.S. military personnel in Bamako again for other reasons and that uh, one or perhaps others of them, at least one I know of, that, uh, that assisted in helping just simply move people, physically move people that were trying to escape the hotel and get them to a secure location, but not involved in the actual operation to go against the terrorists. Okay. And, and I'm sure more information will come out in the future about, about how this transpired. Again, this is all just happening or just concluding, and so I just don't have more yeah. detail. When you say the chief of mission is accounted for, was he or she at the hotel? No, he, it, no, the okay. our ambassador was not. This okay. was, as I said to Matt, this was largely people, people that worked in the, in the mission, but that were staying at the hotel. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can I ask, um, do we have any information on whether this attack is linked to ISIL, or is it too early to say? All I can tell you is that uh, an Al-Qaeda Al affiliated group has claimed responsibility. I'm not in a position to confirm the veracity of that claim, uh, and so I'm, I think it's too soon to tell right now. Uh, John, so, is it true that it was led by Mukhtar bin Mukhtar, who was responsible a couple of years ago for the attack on that uh, oil facility? Is it the same person from Al Qaeda and Al Maghrib, is it? You know, I, I, you I simply don't have more that? details about the, the claim of responsibility. Uh, it's an Al Qaeda affiliated group, uh, Al Mora Baton. Yeah. Uh, claim responsibility for the attack. Um, it's an African jihadist group that's affiliated with Al Qaeda. I, I just don't have more information than that. And again, I, I'm not in a position at this stage to confirm the veracity of that claim. Right. I think this all just happened. Uh, the Malian uh, government will be investigating this, and we need to let that work continue. But you can't confirm or or deny that uh, uh, it is Mukhtar bin Mukhtar, because there were rumors that he was killed a couple of years ago or a year ago or something I, like I, this. But I, he keeps I, I don't have any additional information about responsibility, so I, I just can't. John? Yeah. <coughs> just to clarify the numbers, you said about a dozen Americans were, were rescued, rescued from the hotel. And Some they, of those were mission personnel. Some, but not all. Some were were not involved with the mission. And separately, the uh, chief of mission's um, safety has been has been established. Yes. The chief of mission was not there. Yes. Okay. As I said at the outset, all chief of mission personnel are accounted for are, and are in a safe location. Yeah. yeah Al-Qaeda was out of the pictures in recent days or months, and other groups like in Paris and others were uh, uh, attacking uh, innocent peoples. Is that because Al Qaeda now wants to come on the headlines, and where where are they now? Where they have come from? And I, I, I am I, I'm I'm a spokesman for the State Department. I'm not a spokesman for Al Qaeda, so I wouldn't begin to try to 
Uh, I wouldn't begin. Thanks, to... for, thanks for explaining that to us. No, I mean, it's a, I, I, the, 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 the premise of your question is that I should somehow be able to speak for their intentions and their, and their attempts to get publicity, uh, and I won't do that. Um, there's no excuse, no rationale for this kind of violence, no matter who's responsible, and no matter how it turns out what the claim is, and whether it's this Al-Qaeda affiliated group or some group that's, that's doing this completely separate and distinct from Al-Qaeda. I don't know. And I wouldn't begin to try to speak for their motives. Uh, it's obviously reprehensible. Um, and we're going to work with Malian authorities to the degree that they want our help and assistance in helping uh, in, in the investigation and any other way that they could they can use help to bring these people to, to justice. Um, but it's, it should be also no secret to anybody that, that uh, al-Qaeda offshoots continue to exist um, and to metastasize um, in Africa and uh, – in the Levant and in the Middle East, uh, and that's why we are so. You just heard from Brett McGurk specifically about ISIL. That's why we're working so hard in the international community to find ways to combat groups like this. Uh, but again, what, what their rationale was, I, I, I couldn't begin to tell you, other than just to, to sow terror and fear, which is what groups like this are all about. Can I ask finally, you a question. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, finally, let me ask. You, many people are asking you know, all these groups where they are getting the financing arms and who is supporting them, financing them, and also training them, and who is buying their oil or uh, arming them. Goyal, again, that, that's a. I, I couldn't possibly begin to answer that question. We know there are multiple sources of financing and resources for groups like this. Um, it's regrettable, but they do have uh, streams of revenue, and obviously. Uh, have the ability to attract people to their cause. That's something that we're working very hard to combat. But I couldn't begin to give you the, the balance sheet on, on, on how this group that claims responsibility for it or any other terrorist group does that. Um, what's important to us is that, that we continue to work inside the international community mm -hmm. to combat all those areas of sustenance for terrorist groups. It's hard work, but we're going to stay at it. Right. In terms of the larger relationship between the U.S. and Mali, there is no military aid going to Mali because of the coup from three years ago. So how much assistance can the U.S. government legally provide to Mali, one, as it tries to investigate this attack, and two, as it tries to guard against other possible attacks? You know, this government's been dealing with Islamist groups since before 2012. Well, look, I'd say our, our relations with Mali have been strong for decades and have been based on shared goals of strengthening democracy and reducing poverty. Um, our interests in Mali include promoting stable democracy and improved governments, governance, promoting regional security by combating terrorists and traffickers, uh, reducing chronic vulnerability by improving social development, increasing sustainable livelihoods, uh, and encouraging growth and opportunity. It's a, it's a relationship that we're going to keep, keep working at. Um, Mali remains a willing U.S. counterterrorism partner. The United States resumed initial security assistance cooperation with Mali in 2014 with an emphasis on institution building, civilian control, justice service delivery in the North, and respect for human rights. Uh, and so uh, our, the State Department's anti-terrorism assistance program offered an initial uh, crisis uh, management seminar for senior Malian officials involved in planning responses to terrorist incidents. Um, and. I, I think you can see some of that paying off in the way they responded uh, today. I would also say note here that they're one of six countries participating in the in the President's Security Governance Initiative mm -hmm. announced at the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit, uh, and that initiative focuses on the management, oversight, and accountability of the security sector at the institutional level. So, Sorry, what did you call it? Security Governance? Security Governance Initiative announced at the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit. And then one more. In terms of the... 10,000 or so uh, UN peacekeepers that are in country, of which the U.S. has been a part of this current mission. Do you think that this mission, you meaning the U.S. government, is doing enough to help stabilize and secure Mali, or do other steps need to be taken in order to prevent future attacks such as what we saw today? Well, three things. One, it's we still believe it's an important mission. Two, we're going to continue to support it. Mm -hmm. um, and then three, in the wake of an attack like this, um, I, I won't speak for the UN and what they will or won't do in terms of uh, re-examining re the mission, but it's but as someone always, who has contributed blue helmets, was that? But as someone 
a country that has contributed blue helmets. In the wake of an incident yeah. like this, you know, once you have investigators go through it and work their mm -hmm. way through, you often learn things, lessons learned mm -hmm. that uh, that might affect the way you change your counterterrorism posture, operations, resourcing, uh, whatnot going forward. And that could very well be the case here. I, I think it just happened today. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody's going to leap to any uh, uh, rush judgments here uh, or, or rash decisions. Uh, we need to let the authorities continue to work through the, the scene, uh, let the investigation conclude, and then we'll go from there. But I won't speak for the UN. It's just common practice in, in most countries when you have an incident like this to examine what happened and then and then make adjustments as you need to do going forward. Thank Can we you. Move on? Can we, I want to clarify. just make sure that I, we understand one thing correctly. Um, what you said when you were talking about the role of U.S. military forces who happened to be there was that uh, some number, at least one, helped hostages get to one that safety, I know of. Yeah. One that you know of. Yeah. Um, uh, but none were actually involved in fighting against the hostage takers, to your knowledge. To my knowledge, that yeah, is correct, Arshad. I would refer you to the Defense Department. I think that they're, that's what they're saying as well. Uh, but uh, to my knowledge, no. And they just happen to be at the hotel? I understand. My understanding is they happen to be in Bamako. Okay. Um, and uh, obviously, some of them were either at the hotel or very close by. In order to, have, uh, in order for at least one of them to have helped assist, they must have been in the vicinity. Obviously, but I, I, I simply don't know. Uh, I, I think the, the Pentagon said there was about two dozen yeah. in Bamako. Yeah. Um, but where exactly they were and what they were doing there, I, I wouldn't then, be able to speak to. And then, last one uh, on this, to your knowledge. Uh, those that did go to help uh, hostages get to safety, was that something that they were sort of ordered to do in some organized fashion, or was that just something that they chose to do on the ground because they were there and thought they could help? I think it's the latter. Um, I, I've seen nothing at all in traffic today and conversations I've had that, that this was some sort of order or directed. This is just uh, U.S. Uh, service personnel, at least one of them that I know of, who who do what they do so well, which is run to the sounds of, of guns and and uh, and try to help, and that's that's what my impression is of what happened. Thank you. Just one we, last follow up on that. Maybe. Do you is there any suggestion? To, I know it's early days, but is there any suggestion to your knowledge that the presence of U.S. personnel in the hotel was a factor in it being chosen as a target, or was they just randomly there? I don't know. Like, I simply don't know that. Um, can we move on? Yes. Uh, do you have any? travel by the secretary to announce? I, I do not. Oh, okay. Well, do you expect him to be having Thanksgiving, uh, spending Thanksgiving week uh, in the United States? I think the secretary is looking forward to spending Thanksgiving with his uh, family. The uh, beginning I, I of do the not have, I, right. I do not have any travel well, to announce. Well, as you will time. probably know, there <clears throat> it's been reported elsewhere that the secretary is leaving. And one of the places where yes. it's been reported that he's going to be is Israel. And I wanted to ask you about uh, something that came up at yesterday's briefing, but uh, which had, I think, literally had, had just happened a little while ago, um, and that was the killing, uh, the murder um, of this um, college student from Massachusetts. Do you have any more American citizen college student? Uh, do you have any more, anything to say about that, more to say about that than you did yesterday? Uh, I don't have anything uh, additional uh, to, to say. Obviously, uh, uh, the secretary was deeply saddened to to hear uh, of of the death, uh, and uh, we're uh, obviously concerned by it. Um, and uh, we're going to continue to you know monitor uh, the situation and the circumstances as best we can. And our hearts and prayers obviously go out to the family. Um, do you do, and I know that you don't don't like to play the. Uh, or get into kind of name, name calling, but that you do think that he was killed in a in, a, in a what is a, what was a terrorist attack, right? Uh, I don't think that uh, I'm in a position to characterize the circumstances uh, right now. But again, we're uh, mindful of what happened. Secretary sends his deepest thoughts and condolences right. to the family. I don't but you, have. But you don't think that it might have happened in some kind of a, you know, a, a robbery gone bad or something, do you? Do you believe that, you know, it wasn't just a, was it just a, 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 a 
run of the, I don't want to say run of the mill, like criminal act, because it's certainly not being looked at that way. Yeah, thanks. This is what I was looking for. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for prompting. Uh, we do believe that about the death of Ezra Schwartz, an American citizen from Massachusetts who was murdered in a terrorist attack on Thursday while in Israel to pursue his studies. Again, we extend our deepest condolences to the victim's family, friends, and community, as well as the family and friends of the four other people killed in yesterday's tragic events. The Secretary is also concerned about the five other American citizens who were victims of the attacks and wishes each of them a full and complete recovery. We continue to condemn in the strongest possible terms these outrageous terrorist attacks, these tragic incidents underscore the importance of taking affirmative steps to restore calm. Do you, uh, the other five Americans that you mentioned were all wounded yesterday, or is this over the course of? No, it's the same, it's the same attack. This seems like an awful lot of Amer Americans to be killed or injured, no? Well, it's obviously disconcerting. I, I, uh, we don't want to see that. I, I, if you're asking me if I could draw a line of causation here or intent or motive, I, I, I can't. All right. Well, the, uh, the student from Massachusetts was killed in the West Bank, and I'm just wondering if there was any, um, if, ha have you been in touch with the Palestinians about this? I'm not aware of any direct communication uh, with the Palestinians over this particular. How about with the Israelis? Uh, we have, there has, uh, we've, uh, we've had communications with the Israelis about it, yes. To, um, can you say what, what kind uh, of at, at various means? levels, I would just say. No, no, but I mean, for what? To, I mean, just details, or have you, uh, just what to happened? Just to, to discuss the incident with them and to get their views and perspectives. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Follow up uh, on that. Uh, uh, do you know, were they dual citizens? I mean, these five Americans that know. were attacked? Don't know. I don't know. And, uh, and uh, the person who was murdered, uh, was he, do you know what he was doing, where he was, where he was killed? I don't. Or whether he was working maybe with, with Israeli uh, army soldiers? I don't have that so. level of information. Okay. Do you have any comment? Today, the 87 Palestinians were injured today, many of them by live ammunition. Do you have any comment on that? I haven't seen those reports, Said. Okay. Uh, Obviously, and, look, I, I you guys have access sometimes to information right, here right. that I don't. I haven't seen those reports, but right. nothing changes about what we said before okay. about wanting to have calm restored and violence to end. But I mean, this has been this happened like many hours ago, and so on. So reports have been all over the place that uh, in these confrontations with the Israeli army, you know, whether in demonstrations, we've or condemned after, the we continue to condemn the violence, right. Saeed, and want it to stop. And my last question. Uh, a couple of days ago, uh, 450 new housing units uh, were announced in Ramat Shlomo. Do you have any comment on that? Um, a long-standing position in such act in, on such actions in East Jerusalem as well as in the West Bank is clear. We view this kind of activity as illegitimate and counterproductive to the cause of peace. We remain deeply concerned about Israel's current policy on settlements, including construction, planning, and retroactive legalizations. We remain unequivocally opposed to these kinds of unilateral steps that seek to prejudge the outcome of negotiations. The President has made clear that the parties must demonstrate with actions and policies a genuine commitment to a two-state solution. Contentious actions such as the announcement, this announcement demonstrate just the opposite. Uh, they're going to have detrimental effects on the ground, increase already heightened tensions with the Palestinians, and further isolate Israel internationally. At this sensitive time, we call on all parties to redouble their efforts to restore trust and confidence, promote calm, and return to a path of peace. Okay. Staying in Israel, um, Jonathan Pollard was just released from prison. He's expressed an interest in traveling to Israel, though, of course, the terms of his parole wouldn't allow him to leave the country. I know the White House has weighed in a little bit on this, but can you say whether there are any discussions with Israeli officials about whether um, a loosening of these parole conditions might be in order? No, I'm not aware of any such conversations. And as you rightly said, the White House has already expressed uh, their view that uh, uh, that uh, the Justice Department's going to handle um, his release on parole uh, according to standard procedures, um, and that he will be subject to the general travel restrictions which apply to all parolees. DOJ will have more details on that. Right. 
um, I just want to go back on the, the your answer to Saeed on the, the questions. You said that the, the latest this latest announcement will further isolate Israel, and I, I I'm just um, it may very well, but I'm wondering, is that your message today simply because you were asked the, the question about those settlements? Because I, there's no, no question, you haven't said anything about the Palestinians being isolated because of a massive, or a, a large spate of attacks, including on five or six American citizens, one of whom died just yesterday. And I'm I, I think we've been exceedingly clear about uh, about the degree to which this violence is, is doing nothing to help us get to peace and to eventually a two-state solution. Um, so yes, I stand by what I said in terms of the, 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 you know, there's a difference here between settlement activity, which we continue to consider, consider illegitimate. Um, and we've said before that um, it's not doing anything to get us to a, a two-state solution, and uh, and that it, it it could continue to isolate Israel internationally. That's not a new statement. Um, it's uh, and while we don't want to see settlements, it's it's not the same thing as uh, wanton violence, like well, we've seen in this case. And, clear, and we have been not, we have been ex I think very strident about uh, the danger of increasing violence, continued violence, uh, to not just peace and stability there, but to uh, the ability to achieve a workable, sustainable two-state solution. Do you, um, is there any thought about what you can actually do to try and reduce the reduce the tensions beyond and reduce the violence beyond what the secretary did when he was in Jordan last time, trying to get these and the trying to, the, the steps that he got um, the Israelis and the Jordanians to agree to as regards the Temple Mount. Um, that doesn't seem to have, they don't seem to have, uh, you know, worked any magic. They don't seem to have decreased um, the tensions. And, and and I'm just wondering, is there any thought to trying to do more to get them down? They were never intended to work magic. Well, I don't think anybody. Well, I mean, that's who, not what I'm, I mean, I wasn't. I, that was a. Oh, your bad, words. I'm well, just I know. I mean, not, they, they were not they intended have, to it, work magic. And down. you're right. The tension hasn't gone down. And the secretary continues to be concerned about that and continues to urge all sides to take appropriate steps to do that. I mean, nobody understands how complicated and how challenging this is more than Secretary Kerry. Right. And I think you can expect that he's going to continue to work at this very, very hard. But. Though though we have not seen a decrease in the violence from our last trip to the to the region mm -hmm. and from the agreements he got from both Israel and Jordan, I don't think the secretary would even uh, intend to tell you that he expected uh, immediate results as a result of this. It's going to take work on all sides, not just all right. us. And he's going to stay at it, and he's going to continue to press his concerns with uh, leaders in, uh, right. in Israel uh, this, this and will Palestine. Be this will be my last one. And I'm just wondering, did, does the administration believe that uh, settlement construction and uh, building in East Jerusalem uh, contributes to the violence that we have seen, that that, that might be a factor in uh, motivating uh, Palestinians? I, I don't, uh, you've heard the secretary talk about this, that, uh, that, that you have to look at a range of activities that that aren't contributing to getting us back to a two-state solution, um, and I don't. And I think the secretary has been clear; he's not drawing a line of causation between settlements and the violence. Okay. Uh, so he's been very clear about that. Thanks. Has the, uh, has the plan to put cameras on the Temple Mount been dropped, or is it just slow to implement? It's it, it's not been dropped as far as we're concerned. Um, uh, the Authorities and uh, technicians in Israel and Jordan are supposed to be working this out. I don't know the status of that. You'd have to talk to them. But as far as we know, there's been no intent, no effort, no uh, decision to not move forward with that. Barbara. Is the aim of trying to reduce tensions not only to stop the violence, but to maybe create an atmosphere where you can restart a conversation about some kind of a peace process? Or is Mr. Kerry's plate full with trying to solve the Syria conflict? <laughs> Secretary Kerry's plate is very full on uh, a lot of fronts, uh, but he doesn't b believe that uh, 
that it's so full that he can't continue to work at this issue specifically. And obviously it's difficult to have a meaningful conversation about a potential two-state solution when there's still such violence going on. And so our immediate focus is right now in trying to get the violence stopped, get calm restored, so that adequate space can be, political space can be created for discussions, meaningful discussions going forward on a two-state solution can occur. But it's difficult to, to, to get there, to have a discussion about that when people are still being killed. Yes, in the back there. Can I switch to, to counter ISIL? I don't know. Can, can, can she? Okay, Thanks. go ahead. Thanks. Um, President Alon said earlier this week that he wants to meet Obama and then, and then Putin to kind of have a grand coalition. And you, we just had Brett McGurk here talking about the coalition that already exists against ISIL with 65 countries. Um, Putin's going to Russia, to, to Iran and meeting with Supreme Leader and also seems very interested in trying to become part of this grand coalition. How do you see that they might mesh or are you all um, preempting in a way Putin being involved with the meeting with all the ambassadors next week? I think that um, I think this discussion about coalitions and who's in and who's out is being just way oversimplified. And uh, I, I can tell you that uh, in his meeting with President Olan, the secretary came away um, uh, convinced and heartened by uh, France's uh, the commitment by the president and France to continue if and to intensify their efforts against ISIL inside the coalition. They are a significant contributor to coalition military operations as well as other lines of effort. And uh, it was very clear to the secretary coming out of Paris that, that those contributions would continue and, as I said, uh, likely increase. The pres President Hollande has said that himself. Um, there is a 65-member coalition fighting ISIL. That's the coalition. And as we've said before, if other nations not in the coalition want to to join it and to be a part of it and to focus on the fight against ISIL, well, then that's a conversation that we're certainly willing to have with them. But in order for that to work, uh, every member of the coalition has to have the same focus on defeating ISIL. And thus far, you, you talked about Russia, we haven't seen that same commitment. It's inconsistent with the goals of the coalition, which is to defeat ISIL, uh, if you're also propping up the Assad regime and flying missions in support of the Assad regime and helping the Assad regime stay in power. It's simply inconsistent with the core goal of the coalition itself. If Russia is serious about this, about going after ISIL and, and changing the calculus of the military activities it's conducting inside Syria, well, then that's great. And we'd be willing to have a discussion with them about how they might be able to contribute to coalition operations. We're just not at that stage right now. Thanks. Yeah. What is the core goal? Is it to topple Assad, bring him down, move him from power, or is it to defeat ISIS? I know. I'll, Let's say on the scale of one to ten, are they the same? Are they is one larger than the other? What is the goal? What the goal is, is to degrade and goal? to defeat ISIL. Mm -hmm. It's to been defeat. that since since you know the okay. coalition. Because, was because the issue of Assad keeps coming up uh, all the time. You know, like uh, it's on par with defeating uh, uh, ISIS. But you know, what is on par? I mean, it, like both at the same time, so to speak. You want to have uh, to have. Uh, Assad uh, removed from power and ISIS defeated. Coalition at the, is same not time. the coalition is not, was not created and was not formed. You just heard from Brett McGurk walking right. through yeah. what the coalition is doing. Uh, right. There's nothing in the coalition mandate to remove Assad from power. Mm -hmm. There's a political track, there's a diplomatic track that the secretary is pursuing that will get us to a political transition in Syria away from Assad and to a government that can be responsive to the Syrian people without Assad. That's a diplomatic focus. Now, is, can, can these efforts support one another and be mutually uh, you know, complementary? Absolutely. Because if you, and if you have a, ideally, if you have a responsible government in Syria that actually can issue governance on the whole country and keep Syria whole and unified and pluralistic, uh, then you have the strength, the vitality, the foundation, good governance, and we've talked about this for a long time, uh, to not only kick a group like ISIL out, but keep them out. I mean, one of the reasons they've been 
able to fester and grow inside Syria is because there's been no governance in vast parts of Syria that they can take advantage of. And as the secretary said last week in a couple of speeches, I mean, there, there's actually been a sort of a symbiosis uh, created by the lack of legitimacy by President Assad. So there's a, the, these two efforts uh, can be, should be, and, and will be mutually supportive. But militarily, specifically militarily, the, 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 go, the coalition to counter ISIL is about countering ISIL. That's its focus. And the missions that coalition aircraft are flying, the advice and counsel, training and assistance, that coalition members are giving indigenous forces on the ground in Iraq and in Syria, all that is designed to go after ISIL. Same yeah. subject. Uh, this anti-ISIL uh, fight about this 98 kilometers by Turkish border, uh, is the Turkish troops, uh, is one of the options to clear up ISIL uh, from that uh, part of the... Uh... I'll let the Turkish government speak for what the Turkish military will or won't do. I think you heard from... Uh, uh, Brett McGurk just a little bit ago about uh, the importance of uh, working the border issues in that area um, and our willingness to continue to work with Turkey to that end. But I'm not going to speak for Turkish military participation or operations one way or the other. Do you have any goal or timetable to clear up that uh, that part of the peace by the border? I, I don't have any additional information to give you other than what Mr. McGurk did in terms of timing. Obviously, we all have a shared sense of urgency about the flow of... of uh, smuggled oil, foreign fighters, and resources uh, across that, that stretch. Um, and it's, everybody has a shared sense of concern and urgency about dealing with it, but I wouldn't be able to issue you operational timetables from here, and, and I wouldn't even if I had them. About the smuggled oil you, you just mentioned and the whole oil business, many criticize the U.S. government that it has been 14 months uh, and this oil business has been going on, but now... Uh, U.S. moves to take out many of the targets. Why? Why it took so long to get this point to get out, uh, take out the oil business of ISIL? Well, we've long been focused on the the uh, oil revenue uh, that ISIL has uh, been able to uh, to use and to have access to. Yeah, I mean, a year ago, in my previous job, I. Uh, talked a lot about what we were doing to get at oil collection points and some of their crude refinery, air, uh, I'm sorry, not the crude refinery, but the advanced refinery the sites that they had, the, the, the temporary refinery sites. So going after um, their oil revenues is not a new idea. And I wouldn't speak to the timing of specific targets, and that's for my DOD colleagues to talk to about when and how. Um, Oil trucks are, are hit, and, uh, and and with what uh, with what weapons and to what effectiveness? That's uh, I wouldn't go there, but getting at sources of revenue is not a new line of effort. In fact, it's one of the original lines of effort when the coalition was formed, and it's not just about it's not just about hit, hitting oil trucks and refineries. Uh, there's lots of different ways. They're getting resources from other ways, too. I mean, one of the ways, we talked about this a while ago, that we're, one of the reasons why ground matters to them, uh, aside from their fantasies of being a caliphate, is that uh, you can extort resources, financial resources, from capturing infrastructure. Uh, the Beijing oil refinery isn't just important to them because uh, because of the the oil, it's infrastructure. It's it's a uh, it's a way to uh, to capture human resources as well to keep an oil refinery like that going. So there's a lot there's a lot to this. Why that's why territory matters to them. That's why ground matters to them. And one of the prime ways they get money is extortion and and frankly just flat out robbery. You know, bank robbery. We've seen that too. So this is not going after financing is not a new idea. And it's something that we're going to continue to pursue. Yeah. Uh, new subject, quickly. Uh, if Secretary had met uh, with the Army Chief of Pakistan or not? Yeah, I talked about this yesterday. And uh, have they discussed this uh, this ongoing problem, ISILs and all these problems? Yeah, I read this out yesterday, Goyal. Uh, he uh, met with the uh, General Sharif yesterday. Uh, uh, yes, yesterday. And uh, they talked about, obviously, they talked about the counterterrorism relationship between us and Pakistan. Are you yeah. in South Asia? Sure. Uh, Bangladesh. Do you have anything to say about these uh, apparently planned upcoming executions? Bangladesh? I don't have anything on that, Matt. 
I don't have anything on that. Let me take that for. Let me take that. Do you have anything on upcoming executions in Saudi Arabia, specifically the Palestinian poet, Mr. Ashraf? Yeah, okay. we've seen those reports about this case. I can't confirm specific details. The United States strongly opposes laws, including ap ap apostasy. Apostasy. <laughs> apostasy laws, thank you, that restrict the exercise of the freedom of expression uh, and religion and urges all countries to uphold these rights in practice. These are universal rights enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which all governments have a responsibility to protect. I got one, one more. Yeah, yeah. Jenny. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, on North Korean human rights violations, and uh, do you have any detail about the resolution of UN General Assembly, the third committee on the human rights uh, situation in North Korea? Uh, currently, what is this, students, they made it? On the 19th of November, the U.S. joined 111 other U.N. members in strongly <coughs> condemning the ongoing systematic widespread and gross violations of human rights in the Democratic <coughs> People's Republic of Korea. These egregious actions include torture, public executions, arbitrary detentions, political prison camps, and the extensive use of forced labor. We encourage the Se Security Council to continue to discuss the human rights situation in the DPRK and to consider the relevant recommendations of the DPRK Commission of Inquiry, including on accountability. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. Thank you.